This river runs through here and it gives life. It's kind of like a main artery. It gives life. It feeds all the living things along the shores. The trees, the grasses, the wildlife, they come to the river to drink. And so we need to protect that. Water is the Earth's lifeline. Humans, plants, wildlife die without this precious natural resource. On a daily basis, in order to live, every human needs several gallons of clean water for drinking, to grow plants for food, hygiene, cooking. Water sustains the fish we eat, the plants we harvest, and keeps drinking wells abundant. For many people, water not only quenches the physical needs that every living organism has, but it has a spiritual and medicinal component as well. Water is the lifeline of Indian people. You know, the Indian people has looked at it for thousands of years as their lifeline. And then you go camping, uh, you go hunting, you go, you camp by water streams. You do it because it's, it's a necessity. It's part of, of of life that you have to have in order to survive. Water is not only used for cleansing and to quench a thirst, but to us it's a sacred substance. And it's medicinal. And I remember when I, my elders um, used to tell me, when you go to the river, be sure and pray to the river, you know, because it could take your life so quick, you know. And the water is so precious, too. Now, today on the Flathead Indian Reservation, negotiations have begun over whom has the right to the water. The outcome sure to impact every person residing on the reservation, changing law and stewardship of this critical natural resource forever. This tribe and every other tribe in the nation is entitled, as a matter of federal law, to what are called reserved water rights as well as aboriginal water rights. Aboriginal water rights are generally unquantified as are most tribal rights, water rights. But they consist of waters necessary to preserve pre-treaty activities, hunting, fishing, any sort of cultural uses that water might have been put to prior to treaties. Today there is only one proposal at the table, submitted to the state and federal negotiating teams by the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Some of the biggest questions remain. Why are the tribes asserting themselves in the manner outlined in their proposal? This question is at the heart of the following program. Many times throughout history, and even today at this critical juncture over water rights on the reservation, it is difficult to understand why the tribes take their positions over natural resources, management of these resources, culture, development, education. This program will attempt to put some of those questions into perspective. At the core of what the tribes hope to accomplish within the water rights struggle lies their proposal for reserved and aboriginal water rights in the state of Montana. One of the toughest things to, to do in any kind of setting, uh, tribal setting or otherwise, but in particular in a tribal setting, uh, whether it's negotiations or planning, is to define the, the single simple question and that is what do you want and the tribe has started that process by putting our proposal on the table although it only encompasses seven pages and five different points this document represents a much bigger picture and ideology that tribal people have guided themselves by for thousands of years we need to to look at our balance or do we want uh, survival for the future generations, or do we want to live in a place that, that material things are more important? Because our future generations today, their future rests on our shoulders today, and how well we protect and how well we preserve those. If we don't do it, you know, the end is near. For our children and those yet to come will not have a place to come to. By taking a snapshot in time and place, and looking through a lens of history, culture, science, resource management, and education, 
we can begin to understand the reasons why the tribes come to the table with this proposal. The history of our tribe and our people goes back in time and space, uh, way beyond the creation of the reservation. And uh, the reservation just uh, represents a, a little small piece of that in, in time and space. And, uh, and it represents the future. And I think, uh, so what's at stake is, is all of that, uh, preserving the past, uh, taking careful steps today here in the, in the present, and doing it so that we can preserve things for the future. Now, let's take a look at some of the historical landmarks that took place at Flathead, leading us to today. First were the political and environmental changes that occurred in the area, forcing the tribes to settle on lands at the Flathead Indian Reservation. In July of 1855, 34 years before Montana would officially enter the Union, the area now called the Flathead Indian Reservation was simply a part of the Washington Territory. With the frenzy of western expansion and gold rushes bringing non-Indians into the territory and mining just beginning to explode, tensions over the status of Indian people was rising. These new settlers were encroaching into aboriginal territories of the native peoples who had lived there since time immemorial. Freely living in what is presently known as Montana, Washington, Idaho, Wyoming and Canada were Native American bands of Ponderay, Bitterroot Salish, Kalispell, Spokane, and Kootenai people. Long before white settlers arrived, these groups of Indian people sustained themselves by a tribal system of seasonal hunting, fishing, and harvesting. When the ancestors were existing, the old ones, the old ones, everything was in the, the they used in natural setting, nature. They took what they could use, they used the seasonals, the seasonal cycle. They were here at this time of the season, and they were here at that time of the season. They were there at the next time of the season. Then they'd centralize again. Although differences were many, so were similarities amongst the Indian nations. One key factor, though, was a spiritual connection to the land. These places are so significant for who we are. We didn't have a written language or written text, and our histories are written in that landscape. That's our history. That's where it was written. And we have received help, we seek help from these places, and they have helped us throughout eternity. The hunt for food began every spring when the first bitterroot was harvested, along with camas bulbs, tree moss, onions, potatoes, carrots, and medicinal plants picking berries in the summer and fall, while hunting for bison, elk, and deer, and fishing year-round with trapping in the winter, Indian people lived abundantly as part of the land, not separated from it. And not separated from each other, either. Sustenance and survival of the people reflected in a communal system of hunting and gathering together as a tribe, not as individual families. After a group hunt, the hunters divided the meat among all the people in the camp, each lodge taking what it needed. Successful hunters would share with the unsuccessful ones. This gave the tribe a collective strength, and nothing was ever wasted. Oral traditions are one of the most important ways that the history of this time has been recorded. Today, through the elders of the tribes, Indian people still learn about the history of the Salish, Kootenai and Ponderay people. Some of the most important history lessons for new generations involve understanding how and why landmarks were created. As part of these creation stories, young people gain respect and understanding about the Creator. It is also the way the next generation learns the importance of landmarks imprinted in the places their ancestors have lived for thousands of years. These stories provide guidance, a moral compass, helping them to learn what their expectations of living are in this lifetime. For the Kootenai people, one very respected elder, Adeline Matthias, recalls the creation story of the Flathead Lake. The great lake right here is, it comes from the old history. We call, in my days, we call it fairy tales, and, and that's where this lake come up. There was a couple 
animals a long time ago. And there was no lake whatsoever. There was just little hills and prairies and all, and a lot of berries on the ground. When the animals lived here before us people came. For the Salish people, oral traditions are told through the journeys of coyote. As part of this educational process that has existed for thousands of years, elders still tell coyote stories during the winter months. These stories are like the passages of scripture and other religions. For Indian people, oral tradition is a critical way to preserve spirituality and culture. This is how the new generation learns the value systems, how they're to interact with nature, how they're to honor the land and the community it sustains. The three most important things in, the, in the life is water, earth, and air. Without any one of these three, we wouldn't live, we would perish. So we learn to take care of it. We learn to honor it. We mother, our mother earth, we honor. We call it Father Sky, and all living things in between. The wildlife, the four-legged, the winged ones, the finned ones, and the creeping things of the earth. They all have a specific part in this life. And the Indian people learned that a long time ago. And they passed that knowledge down to the generations. Many non-Indian white European settlers had begun to come to the area by the 1880s, feeling threatened by the Indians who resided there, and with desire to end the tribe's sovereignty of areas deemed appropriate for railroads and expansion, the United States government decided it would serve its citizens best by figuring out a way to confine the Indians to specific parcels of land. The reservation system was born. In July of 1855, the acting governor of the territory, Isaac Stevens, met with the chiefs of the Salish, Ponderay, and Kootenai people near present-day Missoula. The purpose of this meeting was to negotiate a treaty. I said confederated tribes of Indians hereby cede, relinquish, and convey to the United States all the right, title, and interest in... By this time, the Western island. movement of non-Indians and the decline of the great buffalo herds had forced the Salish, Ponderay, and Kootenai people to concentrate most of their settlements to the valleys west of the Continental Divide. After long discussions and with the challenges of translating through interpreters, Governor Isaac Stevens presented the Indian people with the deal they would accept. The Ponderay and Kootenai people would live on what is now the present-day Flathead Indian Reservation, and the Salish would remain in their homeland in the Bitterroot Valley until the government surveyed it with the future possibility that another reservation would be created there for them. If it should prove in the judgment of the president to be better adapted to the wants of the Flathead tribe that the general reservation provided for in this treaty, then such portions of it as may be necessary shall be set apart as a separate reservation for the said tribe. Nor More than 15 years after the treaty was signed, the U.S. government had still not acted, and without any type of surveys, and in direct opposition to the treaty itself, a substantial number of white settlers had moved into the Salish homeland. In 1871, President Grant issued an executive order. All the Bitterroot Salish would be forced to relocate to the north, to the Flathead Indian Reservation. The Salish subchiefs, Arley and Adolf, agreed begrudgingly, but Chief Charlo refused to sign the document. After pressure from white settlers in the area became too strong, in 1891, the last of the Salish people were forced to leave their homeland in the Bitterroot Valley. Under a military escort, they made the journey to the northern reservation. Elders recall a great sadness over the people when they had to leave. This land reserved for them, eventually to be called the Flathead Indian Reservation, was roughly 60 miles long and 40 miles wide, just a fragment of the original Salish, Ponderay, and Kootenays Aboriginal territory. This treaty shall be obligatory upon the contracting parties as soon as the same shall be ratified by the President and the Senate of the United States. By signing the Hellgate Treaty, 
the Salish, Ponderay, and Kootenai people agreed to exchange rights to large tracts of their aboriginal lands outside of the reservation boundaries for reserved lands and resources at Flathead. For compensation, they received a small monetary payment, some federal goods and services, and also federal protection from other warring tribes in eastern Montana. For many, the thought of such a loss of land, of a way of life, is still hard to swallow. But it's also with great pride that today's Native generations look upon the foresight the Indian leaders had at that time. As a homeland, uh, I think that we view how we manage resources on the reservation as uh, a sort of a unified, unitary resource management scheme. And the treaty begins to set that framework uh, even in 1855. And while they weren't necessarily thinking per se about water rights in 1855, I guess in, in some ways we actually began negotiating our water rights back in 1855. It wasn't until 1908 at the U.S. Supreme Court, in a case called Winters versus the United States, that the language of the treaty was put to the test. With this case, originated on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation in Montana, several major characteristics about Indian water rights became clarified in the judicial system. Today these rights are commonly referred to as Winters Doctrine. 1. Federal law defines Indian water rights. 2. The establishment of a reservation by treaty, statute, or executive order includes an implied reservation of water rights on or bordering the reservation. 3. These reserved water rights are set from the date of creation of the reservation. 4. The quantity of water reserved for Indian use has to be sufficient to irrigate all the practicably irrigable acreage of the reservation the court ruling it unreasonable to assume that the Indians would reserve lands for farming and pastoral purposes without reserving the water to make those uses possible. 5. Winter's rights are not lost by non-use. Within the context of the Supreme Court ruling on Winters versus the United States, the Indian leaders had also ensured water rights to future generations still to come. There's an absolute guaranteed right to reserve water rights. The question is, how much? With the creation of the reservation, federal law became more colorful and complicated. In layman's terms, the law of the land is federal, the reservation being a federal entity. But with understanding that the federal government holds assets of the land for the benefit of the Indian people, for the treaty specifically states, the reservation was created to serve Indian people living there. So our philosophy is, is that we're trying to um, uh, bring to the tribes trust assets, because that's what we're trustee for, is for trust assets, water of which is one, um, that were promised them when, when we entered into an agreement with them to, when the reservation was created. place when I go down to take a sweat. We used to have a lot of frogs down there. There used to be a lot of frogs. There used to be those, those oysters and the freshwater oysters down there. We had uh, those bullheads we had in the water. I, I don't see them anymore, you know, and it's, it's gone. It's from the sprays that all kind of washed into the, into the creeks and farmers. And, it, it's, it's just kind of sad. With the environment rapidly changing, a way of life also changed for Indian people. It was a new time. Suddenly communal subsistence changed dramatically. Non-Indians were introducing a new way of managing the land and resources, and it was in terms of individual ownership. By 1904, amid strong opposition by the tribes, the Flathead Allotment Act passed in the U.S. Congress, shepherded in part by a powerful local politician named Joseph Dixon. As part of a national policy to open remaining lands for white settlement, federal agents arrived at the reservation to enroll tribal members and assign individual land allotments. Salish Chief Charlotte fought hard to stop the government from trying to make the Indian people like white men. Journeying to Washington in 1905, and sending a delegation again in 1906, he petitioned President Theodore Roosevelt to halt the allotments, 
These pleas did not change the government's decisions. Chief Charlot had fought the last years of his life against such action. Fifteen days after his death, though, April 1, 1910, by presidential proclamation, approximately one million acres of the reservation were opened up. Non-Indian settlement of the Flathead Reservation began in earnest. It would change the landscape forever. That's how the white man ate covered wagons first come around was around summers. And on the night when they let them come in the reservations to put up their claims and, you know, and they start to, my grandparents said that night you could just hear, you know, pounding in something in, that's when they were taking their acreages right all over in Dayton where I live. One of the biggest changes in the landscape reflecting this influx of non-Indian settlers was construction of the Flathead Irrigation Project. Authorized by Congress in 1908, it was justified as primarily serving the interests of the Indians, but benefited non-Indian settlers to a far greater degree. Without it, many of the non-Indian homesteads would have failed, as many did in the first few years until the project was completely finished. The effect on the natural flow and course of streams on the reservation changed drastically. And today these changes are still evident with 17 different reservoirs and an extensive system of canals and structures ranging around 1,500 miles long. This system was costly though, and with electrical power becoming more critical because of the boom in development, local businessmen and irrigators saw an opportunity to recoup costs for the irrigation project by generating a hydroelectric dam on the lower Flathead River. The tribes opposed this development. For the Salish, Ponderé, and Kootenai people, the Flathead River Corridor, especially the proposed Kerr Dam site, there was great cultural significance. By 1928, though, after an extensive lobbying effort by local non-Indians and Washington politicians, Congress authorized a permit for the Rocky Mountain Power Company to develop a power site at Kerr Dam. And in a commemorative ceremony ten years later, Kerr Dam went online officially as the new dam of the lower Flathead River. Today, Kerr Dam stands on the Flathead River over 54 feet taller than Niagara Falls. For the tribes, it's both bitter and sweet. With its construction, the tribes feel an important cultural site was destroyed. No monetary compensation will ever measure up. Once the dam was finished, though, by securing the position of co-licensee after the first licensing period ended in 1980, Today, the tribe is making the most of the situation by determining economic benefits from the dam, but most importantly, by recapturing this important cultural site. But the economics isn't, isn't the main goal here. We have a reciprocal relationship with this place that has watched over us and our ancestors for such a long time. The whole value system and everything that, that they believed in at that time still carries through to us in our generation today of how we're supposed to take care of the water when we pray for that water every day when we take a drink of water any time because we don't know if that's going to be the last time the concept of owning land individually was incredulous it was part of creation for stewardship not something to dominate the land was for no man to own but for non-indians this worldview was very different Cooney elder Matt Michelle recalls being a young boy and hearing the story of his grandfather's first encounter with a white settler. I told him my grandfather he was trespassing. And he said he bought the land and he bought the water. When he got through saying that there's late in the fall and you know how them leaves are, there's a very few of them leaves hanging on a tree on the bush. So he took one dry one, below the dam, he, he put the leaf down and the leaves floating down. He says, you bought the water. He says, that water you bought is long gone. And this water where we stand on, it's my land and it's my water. The white man did buy his land, but the water he bought is all gone. <laughs> the leaf floated down the stream, but not the Indian people's troubles. In the span of one lifetime, Changes have been significant. 
Elder Agnes Kenmel recalls the water she knew as a young woman many years ago. Everything was just clean. Everything. The water, the creeks, and my brother used to fish, and he would catch a bunch of little fish, just out of a little tiny creek, right by our house. So you'd catch fish. <laughs> Oh, that water did, just coming down from the mountains. We find in this day and age that this resource that we thought was unlimited is not. It's, it's very fragile, and, a, and, a, and if we don't take care of it um, at a responsible, in a responsible manner, that it could be lost forever. Today, the fight over land and natural resources on the Flathead Indian Reservation has changed somewhat, but still remains. When the Supreme Court decided in 1984 that the Montana Water Court was going to be the forum that initially uh, adjudicated the water rights of the Indian tribes in Montana, that more than anything else, I think, is what brought the tribes to the table and gave them the incentive to sit down with the state and try to reach out of court settlements of these water rights claims. To date, Five of Montana's eastern reservations have settled with the state and federal negotiating teams. Now the push lies across the mountains. The Blackfeet and Flathead reservations, the last two expected for settlement in Montana. The tribes believe, um, and they have a, you know, they can make a very good case um, for um, for the, the the right to access to all the water that's on the reservation. Uh, when the reservation was created, it was just created for their exclusive use, and nothing has transpired to really change that. If the United States has done anything that would have been helpful, it would have been helpful if we would have started this process about 100 years ago instead of doing it now. Although the idea of beginning formal negotiations over a century ago may have made it easier, relatively speaking, it's still a new process. And today, within the Department of the Interior, the federal agency responsible for the trust relationship between the tribes and the government, there are over 20 negotiations ongoing at any given time, with the West alone encompassing over 280 different tribes. Why now? Why this way? Many times it is a difference of vision. Reflecting the vast diversity in communities across a reservation, in a town such as Ronan, a clearer picture emerges. Because of the high rate of non-Indian settlement that still remains today, the latest census indicating that for every one Indian residing on the reservation, three non-Indians also live there. The way people envision resource management is as diverse as the population. Who has the right to water has been a hotly contested issue. For all of us that live in the Flathead and in the Mission Valley and the whole uh, process here, uh, water is critically important. The number of cows that I run or that any rancher runs would probably be cut at least by a third, if not more, maybe by half, uh, to be able to, to operate. And when you look at the scale of economics, that wouldn't work very well. We know that we have a history with Indian tribes, and we know that it's not a you know, sterling history. Um, but by the same token, as trustee, what we're really obligated to do is protect the resources that came about by virtue of the creation of the reservation. There's community-based knowledge that the tribal membership has for for being here for such a long time and so the relationship with the landscape the people's sense of place you know this is their this is absolutely their home and and they want to protect it and make sure it's here for forever today active negotiations over reserved water rights on the flathead indian reservation have begun again with the fourth negotiation session taking place recently in polson Although the first talk of negotiating the water began in the early 1980s, the tribe and state both recognized other priorities at the time. Talks dwindled. Technically, all sides remained in negotiation, but it wasn't until 1995 that the process was reinitiated. And with greater urgency, the state had attempted to issue new permits on the reservation, forcing the tribes to take the state to court. Each time the court ruling in favor of the tribes, the decision? The state does not have authority to issue new water permits until the water rights on the entire reservation are adjudicated. Not only are there an abundance of federal cases that support tribal water rights generally, reserved rights, 
There are an abundance of them that support the rights of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes specifically. In other places where they have litigated these, they have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on attorneys and court costs and appeals. And, you know, the tribes end up getting a water right. Um, they're fighting with their neighbors about it. And nothing ever gets settled, and I think that's unfortunate. In June of 2001, a proposal for negotiation of reserved and aboriginal water rights in Montana was submitted by the tribes to the state and federal negotiating teams. As anxious as we are to have a settlement, if we just follow the, the traditional state approach to quantifying our reserved water rights, that it could take a decade or more yet to, to finish this process and because things are just so complicated here. But our proposal really has the possibility of, of providing a solution that can help everyone here on the reservation and in a very realistic way could shorten the time frame uh, to maybe even five years. In a seven-page proposal, the tribes cite legal rights, historical and aboriginal rights, coupled with scientific justification and support. We proposed to solve the apparent dilemma between tribal ownership and the existence of junior water users on the reservation by defining a reservation-wide tribal water administration and net water management program that will recognize tribal ownership and recognize existing uses. Part one of the proposal is an introduction. How do the tribes view water? To the tribes, the beauty and sacredness of water are of the highest value. The intrinsic cultural and spiritual value is pervasive among our people. Water has long been considered a medicinal substance, which is one reason it is considered sacred. We believe, however, that water is to be shared among animals, plants, and humankind for the mutual benefit of all. In part two of the proposal, we propose that the focus of negotiations be the development of a reservation-wide tribal water administration ordinance, which guarantees due process and equal protection under a prior appropriation system to all people who use water on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Fundamental to this approach is that all water on the reservation is tribal. It is this language, all water on the reservation is tribal, that some people have trouble with. Well, no one owns all the water. We have a right to use the water while we live here and while we uh, uh, have our livelihood from the water. But nobody owns the water. You uh, have a right to use the water. And that's a critical and uh, part of it and a very important part of it. In part three, the framework for the proposal is given. The negotiation process will guarantee the development of an ordinance that affords due process to all people claiming or asserting a protectable interest in water on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Non-Indian claimant to reservation water shall be afforded protections equal to those available off the reservation. The state wants to move forward with a process that they're comfortable with and they're used to. We need to define not only a pace but a method for negotiating water rights here on the reservation that we are comfortable with and that makes sense to us. The tribes say they do not plan on turning off the spigot to anyone, Indian or non-Indian. If people will look at what we're trying to accomplish, understand that we're not trying to hurt anybody, understand that we're just trying to define a, the best way to manage the resource uh, uh, for the reservation residents, what is wrong with a local, a strong, knowledgeable local government managing that resource for all the people of the reservation? Absolutely nothing. I don't think the proposal is about the tribes gaining control of the water so that they can run non-Indians out of businesses and, and things like that. I, I do believe that the tribes want to be fair with everyone about providing adequate amounts of water to everyone who needs it. With this management comes obligation, a major component of sound progress being a solid understanding of the resources. With this perspective, Division Manager Tom McDonald says the tribe has placed high priorities on hydrological and biological studies for the past several decades. With a long history of litigation cases, the bar is set high. When we gather our information, we're usually 
99% of the time held to a, an accountability standard that's much higher than anybody else. So, so consequently, um, a lot of the inf we have to gather more information. Our information has to be dummy proof. It has to be court proof. It has to be withstand the opponents or anybody else else's expert witnesses. And and so we absolutely have to be very very good at, at, at our information and the stuff we bring to the table. The protections that we are putting in place here uh, from water quality to air quality to the many areas that we uh, look at as a tribal government that's not only going to be for the best interest of our tribal members, it's going to be for the best interest of everybody who lives on the reservation. But amidst intense development pressures on the reservation and changes in the landscape over time, there has still been an inevitable toll exacted on wildlife species and the ecosystems that sustain all life. With an emphasis on equalizing this balance between stewardship and development, the tribes say the successful reintroduction of trumpeter swans to the flathead is indicative of their management policies, that it reflects an instilled, deliberate equilibrium supporting natural species, and even replacing some elements that may have been lost forever. I think it's to a thought process of, well, okay, maybe you can do without this one. Uh, ten years down the line, what else can you do without? And at some point, what do you have left? The difference I try to tell people is we have another element that we almost always consider, if not always consider, is the spiritual value of, of the resource and the connection between our people and the Creator through the, through the resource that we have. It's very important for me, for my kids to grow up in this area where I've grown up. For many tribal members, the lack of quality housing and community infrastructure force people to leave the reservation. But today, Kat Inyas is one of many returning home to the Elmo area. She's benefiting from a new program called the Tanaka Community Development Corporation. I'm glad we don't have to move from where we grew up at. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else other than here in Elmo. This expansion of housing and the methods for achieving this development are a paramount concern to the tribes. It's a fine line. The needs of the people, the allure of the place to outsiders, a quality of life. People come from California, they come from back east, they have their own idea of what owning land means and they bring those ideas with them. And certainly they're often in conflict with what the tribe stewardship role is. At Flathead, past housing programs were directly administered by the federal agency Housing and Urban Development. Housing Director Bob Gochi says it was a system out of touch with the local needs. For years, the uh, tribal members across the country, but here particularly, were, were not housed as well as America as a whole. Across the country, only 4% of the, uh, of the population depends on HUD. In Indian country, it was over 50%, and so you, you got a disproportionate number of people living in housing that really doesn't reflect their culture, their lifestyle, or what their needs are. Now the tribe is attempting to change this fundamental need for adequate housing. Today the Salish and Kootenai Housing Authority is spearheading a housing renaissance on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Most of our members that we're housing already live here. And they're already, uh, you know, they're living with a family, they're in, in overcrowded condition, they're in substandard housing. So what we're trying to do is, is better their housing condition. Yet development has the same impact to the environment no matter who initiates it. And with substandard housing for many tribal members beginning to change, and with outside pressures for expansion, development on the Flathead Indian Reservation is inevitable. In proposed development areas such as this near Polson, the question remains, how will it occur? The tribes have decided. They want it done according to principles of a tribal value system. And for their part, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are making sure to account for how growth is managed. The threat to our tribe uh, for resources is much more significant than almost any of the other reservations because we have such a population explosion here. The majority of those people are not members of our tribe. So to protect the resources long term for what our members are going to need uh, far into the future is, 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 uh, is an important part of the negotiation now. 
In only one lifetime, the impact of development has already changed the environment irrevocably. Elder Matt Michel recalls a flathead lake he knew as a young man. They used to fish for squawfish, suckers, and whitefish. And after that, in the wintertime, the ice used to be, oh, look, I don't know, it's about two, three feet thick. We used to have hard time to chop through the ice. And they used to travel through the ice. They used to go with horses and sleigh across, taking a shortcut. That's how it was years and years ago. Now, last 15, 20, 30 years, there's no more ice on the lake because it's polluted. There was no homes. Look, you see now, look at all the homes. The Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay people feel concern. With these types of changes in water quality, losses to cultural and spiritual resources are imminent. With this in mind, the tribe's proposal for negotiation of reserved and aboriginal water rights on the Flathead Indian Reservation avows a desire to manage development and growth in a way that will minimize losses to these precious natural resources. To survive as a people, as a distinct culture, Preservation Director Marsha Pablo says it's not a choice, but an obligation. As an engineer with their numbers and their rulers, and if you can tell me how much impact is going to destroy our spiritual place, tell me how much, and then I can tell you and guide you how far you can come, how far you can, can um, expand or whatever. But we don't know that. So that's why the tribes take such a strong stand at times and say no, no, no um, development, no, because they don't know the formula. Nobody does. For Indian people, it means protecting the places that their ancestors walked, considering today the exact footsteps that past generations took as they have lived through the ages of thousands of years and making sure these paths will be clear for the next hundred generations to come. It's an investment in a homeland where fathers and mothers have been buried since the beginning of time. And for this, the tribe says, there is no choice, it's their place. For the Perez family, Lane, Susan, Nissa, and Amanda. It's an investment that continues with each generation. The ancestors, the people today, are rooted into this land deep. So regardless if it uh, has boundaries and it has um, regulations, when I take our children there, my nieces and my nephews, that's a con uh, that continues our presence that shows that we continue. We were the first Indians that had have homes around here. We were, at the beginning of time, we were always here. And we got to know who I am. And you got to know my connection to the water, to the earth, and to the sky. You got to know my connection spiritually to everything around me so you can understand where I stand. So he can understand why I'm trying to protect what's around me. You can look at it in a, I guess in the Native American ways, eyes, the, the, the water itself is the milk of the Mother Earth, you know, to keep it clean. This is what feeds everything. Everything has to survive on water. We need water. There's nothing different about the respect that we show for the land, for our elders, for our parents. The, the water is the same respect. For many Indian children at the Flathead Indian Reservation, traditional schooling isn't simply the only education they'll receive growing up. The annual river honoring on the Flathead River is a three-day spring event that brings over a thousand kids both Indian and non-Indian, from all over the reservation. It's an important example of how the children learn more than just textbooks. 
I'm so happy to be out here so I can learn about different cultures and stuff. And what this does is bring these, these, younger, this young, these younger children and really introduce them to what uh, natural resources are and what we can do to help conserve those natural resources or use them wisely. It's better than sitting there and looking out of the textbook and writing stuff down on paper. The tribe says that by instilling respect for their place, past, present, and future, children will learn to take only what is needed from the land. Teach them to respect it, you know, and not dirty it, garbage, pick, clean their camps up, pack in what you pack out, pack out what you pack in. When these kids come out here, it's for them to be able to, to um, you know, wake up in the morning to listen to the songs to be able to listen to that drum, to be able to come back in time, so to speak, and get off that fast lane down there. Through their proposal for Aboriginal and reserved water rights negotiations, the tribes want to assert this way of thinking about management of the land, past, present, and future. They said she was coming over here to catch oh. a fish. <laughs> Indian people have a very close connection with the environment. Look at it, you know, as things having life, even rocks having life. And all the animals being important and uh, so it's really something with highway 93 for example uh, people just want to you know build a high-speed highway right through the area the Indian people are very concerned about the wildlife and about the game and the yet cars highways development these are a part of reality today and the confederated Salish Kootenai and Ponderay tribes must find a way to reconcile these vast differences of life in the 21st century the road is going to go right through there. That's how far Holding on to their own life experiences and also a well of knowledge that has been passed down for generations. For Indian people, tribal elders hold the keys to the past. Whenever you take something from the earth, be sure to put something back. If it's a word of prayer, put it there, wherever you took something from. If you take a medicinal plant, you put something there. Take something out of your pocket and leave it there. If you got a little tobacco, put a little tobacco there, whatever. But leave something in its place. Because you may want to come back and, and take again. It will be there to take again. As long as you put back, you can always take. Whenever a monumental decision is to be made, the elders are always consulted. One forum for this dialogue and learning takes place at the tribe's culture committees. At the Kootenai Culture Committee offices in Elmo, young and old alike can visit and learn about their language, history, cultural practices, and subsistence. This is also true for the Salish Ponderay Culture Committee offices in St. Ignatius. But again, as part of the challenge Native people face to live by a value system unique to Indian people, they must also be able to navigate aspects of mainstream culture as well. The current negotiations taking place over water, delineating the need for the tribes to understand mainstream law, culture, language. In our educations now are our shields. The words are our weapons. The documents are our weapons. It's a different battleground. It's the same fight. And um, at least we're educated now to the fact that when we sit across the table, we know exactly what, what is being said. We know exactly what the law says. We know exactly what our options are. One institution bridging these two worlds of native and mainstream cultures effectively is the Salish and Kootenai College. Within this institution of higher education, students both native and non-native can work towards several different Bachelor of Arts programs or associate degrees, yet still keep their feet planted in tradition. We've designed a curriculum that has our culture. We're very concerned about preserving the Salish and Kootenai culture and helping preserve American Indian culture throughout. The tribes say this preservation is the core of their proposal for water rights. We're caretakers of this water that's coming through. It's our responsibility to keep this water nice and clean, to, to come down so the fishes will have a good life, the birds, for other people to use it, to drink it, to go on downstream. Without the whole process of water, you know, keeping us going, giving us that life, feeding us every day, taking care of us, protecting us as a medicine, we wouldn't live.
I'm encouraged. Um, I think we're optimistic that we're going to make progress. I think it's going to be slow and it's going to take time. And it's also very early and a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of things are going to happen between now and the time that we, uh, that we reach a conclusion. We're just committed to working up in the Flathead. Um, we know it's going to take a long time and we're going to hit some bumps in the road, but uh, uh, we hope we can change some of the working relationships up there and, and get something done over the next few years. No one wants to make a quick decision and a rash decision and something that's not going to uh, take care of things over time. Uh, there's lots of sharing information that has to occur in the next uh, year or two. Uh, so I, I'm not, I don't think anybody's disappointed in the speed of things. Uh, it's just going to take time. And so today, one of the toughest negotiations continues on the reservation. Our lifetime on Earth should be to prepare to pave the way for future generations. If we work today towards preservation, you know, they have a better chance. Across Indian country, you'll hear this is the veins of our Mother Earth. Every tribe in some way interprets that. This is the veins of our Mother Earth, the blood of our Mother Earth. We only have one shot at this. There isn't a second take on this. We, we are going to do this one time, and since we're only going to do it one time, and it's for future generations to have, to preserve for their future generations, we have to do it right.